Welcome. Uh, I'm Jacob Reynolds. I'm the Partnerships Manager at the Academy of Ideas, the Organised Battle of Ideas Festival. I'm, I'm really excited for this discussion. It's one of those discussions that is hard to avoid anyway. You turn, you can't open the newspaper, you can't uh, avoid the argument with your partner or spouse about when you can turn the heating on. It's this question of energy is really one of the, the really pressing questions that we face uh, as, as a country. Um, and despite the somewhat tabloid title we've given it, for frack's sake, how do we solve the energy crisis, we do want to have a kind of a broader discussion about what energy we need, how much of it, where are we going to get it from, what political choices does that entail, what kind of economic plan or progress would be needed to have proper energy security, what mistakes have been made uh, in the past, and ultimately uh, kind of grapple with the fact that as a fundamental Thing we need and we need energy i think we need much more of it and maybe the panelists might disagree but how are we going to get there how are we going to have the energy that we need for the kind of country that we want to build so there's a lot tied up in this but i'm really glad that we've got um a really great panel to help us pick through it so i'll introduce them briefly and then we'll we'll kind of get to business so speaking first from me james woodhausen who's over uh, on your left he's a visiting professor of forecasting and innovation at london south bank University. Uh, speaking next, who's here on my left is Tom Heap, who many of you recognise as the environment forecaster from Countryfile, um, Panorama, uh, and Crossing the Earth. He's also the presenter of the Climate Show with Tom Heap and the author of 39 Ways to Save the Planet. Speaking next will be Dr. Casper Hewitt, who's a lecturer uh, and degree program director at the Water Group Euro Aqua uh, School of Engineering at Nottingham, uh, Newcastle, sorry, University, and director of the Great Debate. And then speaking uh, finally is Laurie Laban, who's a researcher and writer. He's an associate fellow at the Institute for Public Policy Research and the co-author of Planet on Fire, a Manifesto for the Age of Environmental Breakdown. Without any uh, further need for any more introductions, I'll just turn then to James and ask him for uh, five to six minutes, and I'll be certainly strict at the end of six minutes, uh, to help us uh, kick off this discussion on energy. James. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Vaclav Smil, as in smile, but without an E, uh, recently pointed out that uh, since 2000, the proportion of our energy globally, he's keen on the global energy system that is generated by fossil fuels, has declined from 86% to 83%. And he asked the question, and that's a little fiddly, you know, why are we going to be able to reduce it to 0% uh, in the next 20 years? In fact, the goal is uh, 2050, but we can allow him that. Uh, and we're still not going to do it, folks. We are not going to get rid of fossil fuels by 2050. Um, and uh, what we've got to ask, really, is how is it that that fairly elementary point about uh, fossil fuels and our need in particular for gas to back up the intermittent nature of renewables and to back it up every time with dispatchable energy in a way that even nuclear power isn't yet able to do. You can't ratchet back nuclear power or if your wind power is generating too much uh, electricity as Scottish wind power manufacturers or people running the installations have been asked to do by the government where too much energy is a problem. When you've got too much energy, nuclear is not going to back it up very easily. It's got to be gas. So it's not just me, but it's Vaclav Smil, um, who is a Czech-Canadian uh, great author on energy, suggesting to us that it's just not going to happen. Then why is there this enormous uh, furore about ESG? Hands up who doesn't know what ESG is. Oh, well, that's great. Uh, you're not missing much, I'll tell you. Um, it's economic and social, social and governance criteria by which you judge major firms. And uh, it just so happens that the tide is turning, and this is my message uh, really this afternoon, because the New York Times, which generally takes an extremely carbonista attitude to everything, recently published uh, an article uh, by Hans Taparia, who's an entrepreneur at the Stern School of Business in New York City. And the article is called, One of the Hardest Trends in the World of Investing is a Sham. Uh, and he rightly says that 
the ratings agencies, the people who draw up charts and performance lead tables about how economically, socially, uh, uh, environmentally, sorry, socially, and in terms of government uh, corporations are, the companies that, ratings companies that draw these tables up, like Standard & Poor or Sustainalytics, there's a name, um, quote, don't rate firms on environmental or social responsibility. They measure how much potential harm ESG factors like CO2 have on financial performance. So you can get a high ESG rating, and ESG is all the rage in the city of London and uh, on Wall Street, and yet that can only be from the fact, not that you're doing environmental good things, but you're avoiding doing environmental bad things. And he concludes, Tafaria, the current system for ESG investing is just regular capitalism at its slickest, ingenious marketing in the service of profits. So what we have is an inflated phenomenon, namely all of these ratings and who wins and who doesn't in corporations. Uh, at the same time as you and I know, with Vaclav Smil, that a real uh, energy transition, which is the nice way that green people like to dignify their silly remarks, uh, an energy transition is just not going to happen at a moment when the influence, until very recently, of ESG thinking, uh, where everything is rated in terms of CO2 emissions, has never been higher. It was good to see that pushback, ladies and gentlemen, because uh, it's happening also in Africa, and that's terrific news. The president of Senegal has recently said, why are we being asked by John Kerry in the United Nations not to develop fossil fuels when no nation in the, uh, on the globe has yet developed a modern economy on the basis of renewables? And I'm pleased to say that not only Senegal, but I believe Nigeria and other countries are going to push back on this patronizing Democratic Party oldster that is John Kerry, worth quarter of a billion dollars, married into the Heinz family, uh, Mrs. Heinz. So th those are the people who are trying to restrict growth, restrict fossil fuels for Africa, because uh, they don't want Africa to compete uh, with Europe. So the point of my tale is that we might like sustainable renewables to run the country, and that might appear a way forward for some, but you're running up against the laws of physics because those sources of energy are extremely diffuse. Please don't tell me, if anybody else on top of Keir Starmer tells me that offshore wind is nine times cheaper than uh, what's available from gas, let me say that if renewable energy is so cheap, nine times cheaper than gas, and if it also reputedly handles 43% or 40% of our electricity supply, then why have we all got fat energy bills if we're largely renewable on renewables and renewables are so cheap? How does that work out? Riddle me that. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. Tom, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so the current crisis that we're in, in terms of energy, cost of living, and some aspects of the international security crisis are quite clearly caused by our reliance on fossil fuels. It seems to me as plain as the nose on all of our faces. So, even if you don't care or don't believe about the perils of man-made climate change, the need to accelerate the deployment of renewables seems screamingly obvious. Uh, it needs to be done quickly, it needs to be done more rapidly, because that would help in a number of those ways. Thankfully, many people do care about climate change, and this year's record temperatures in the UK and Europe and uh, fires in the US both illustrated this problem in the short term, whilst what was going on with our global energy crisis illustrates this problem in the long term. We had in front of us the most clear motives for promoting renewables, promoting energy conservation, being sensible in the way we use it, and yet we hardly heard a word about it in the battle to be our prime minister over this summer. Something I found 
deeply shocking. Then I thought, well, maybe it's because the electorate they're uh, seeking the votes of uh, don't care a great deal about this particular subject. And fair enough, in that case, you have to tailor your argument to the folk that you want to vote for you. But what did shock me, because remember, this wasn't just the election of a leader of a party. This was the election of a prime minister that they were allowed to get away with ignoring this stuff by a lot of our media. I found that really quite alarming. This is a really, really important issue. I would argue as important as the economic crises we're having at the moment, if not more so. And yet there was very, very little scrutiny of what our uh, current prime minister, uh, and indeed her rival actually, had to say about an issue. And it wasn't like it was abstract during the summer. The debate actually took place when we had 40 degrees. The debate actually took place when we're seeing record energy bills and a probable recession as a result of our reliance on fossil fuels. It wasn't difficult. They should have been asked a lot more about it. Um, and also, you know, we are the current chairs of, of COP, the international uh, IPCC, you know, the UN-backed debate on these things we are in, that we held in Glasgow last year. We remain chair of that until it, we hand over to Egypt later this year. I think people are happier to discuss, a lot of our media are happier to discuss issues that they think they understand, politics and economics, rather than issues to do with energy and the environment. So undoubtedly accelerated deployment of renewables has to happen. But there are also a couple of inconvenient truths, facts if you like, I recognise, and they are, and I would agree with, with James on this, obviously, that renewables are intermittent and also, as he quite rightly says, roughly 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuel. So, unlike some people, I do believe that we should be not only keeping but extending nuclear power. For me, it's quite simple. I find a low carbon future, which I believe is essential, much more plausible with less nuclear in, uh, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> with nuclear in the mix. And it is a personal thing. A lot of the stuff to do with nuclear comes from sort of core feelings about risk. For me, I am more concerned about the peril of climate change than I am about fears over atomic safety. That's me, others may disagree, but one of them seems much more like a real and present danger. Um, and it was ironic, I was in, uh, for work, I was in Hunterston, one of the big nuclear power stations up in Scotland, which they just closed at the beginning of this year, despite the fact they had its best performing year in terms of performance and safety last year. And that seems to me a direct connection to people you serve. But on the fossil fuel point, it is, I think, uh, whilst I would hope that we could rapidly accelerate our, our distance from fossil fuels, it ain't going to happen overnight. And for me, and this is an, uh, somewhere else where I might go against some, uh, a totem of some uh, people who are concerned about the environment, I'm a strong believer in carbon capture and storage. I think it has to happen. And the reason it has to happen is that we are going to carry on burning stuff for quite a while. The oil and gas companies actually know how to do it. They've never been given the motive to do it. And if I was the government today, I'd be saying, you know, all those profits you're making, we either take them off you in the form of windfall taxes, or we, you've got to commit to investing in this technology. It's <coughs> definitely doable. Yes, it would make fuel more expensive, but nothing like the jumps we've seen recently. And there is, I think, a really useful way of, of conceiving this as well. In the past, when it... Sorry, second. In the past, when it came to our uh, water, we used to uh, take the water in and our sewage we used to let go. And then we realized it was dangerous for us and dangerous for the planet. So we grew up and we got a sewage treatment system. We pay more for that in our water bills than we do for the supply. Cleaning it up, we pay more for. We should be doing the same with fossil fuels, CO2 of the, of the, of the pollution, the sewage of fossil fuels. We should be paying to clear it up. It's a grown-up thing to do. Avoiding that is, frankly, infantile, because growing up is about taking responsibility for what you do, your actions and the harms you cause. That's what we should be doing here. This, even for, if for some, it means engaging with people who do have oil in their hands. Well, 
Fantastic. Thanks, Tom. Very good. Um, Casper, your opening thoughts. Um, okay, I, actually, interestingly, I wasn't going to particularly talk about fracking, but no, nobody has. Oh, yeah. so, so maybe I'll throw something. I'll say something, something about fracking. Um, I mean, uh, who, who's against fracking? Is anyone against fracking? There's a few, few people, yeah. not many, actually. Okay, that's that's interesting. It's just just, just interesting to know. Um, I think um, I think the main point I would make about fracking is is that actually there seems to be resistance to every form of energy, and and I think that that's 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 the really interesting thing about it. Um, you know, whether it's coal, whether it's gas, whether it, you know, whatever it is, some, someone wants to resist it. Um, whether it's wind farms, you know, some, someone wants to resist it. Whether it's tidal power, people want to resist it, all for, all for different reasons. But actually, what we need is more energy, for sure. We, we don't need less. We, we have to have more for the future, especially if we are going to move to electric cars. This is the direction that we seem to be going in. We're going to have a massive demand for electricity that we, we simply couldn't fulfill with, with um, current output. So that, that's, that's something that, that's worth thinking about. You know, how are we can, going to generate it? I think fracking could probably play a small part. I, th I think it's only, it's only ever going to be a small part. So it, it is a bit of a, a side issue. Um, I think um, one of the things that I did think it was, was reading a little bit about, about fracking um, in the run-up run up to this, just to have a few thoughts about it. The argument that it won't reduce the cost of gas, I thought, was quite an interesting one because it all depends on how you organise it, doesn't it? Because I think the argument was or is that um, it would get sold on the world market and therefore it'd be a very small amount compared to the world market and therefore it wouldn't affect the price of gas um, significantly, if, if at all. Um, <coughs> but that's if you decided to sell it on the world market and if you had it in... in private hands and, and you were, you were um, actually organising it in that way. It actually highlights to me some of the stupidities of capitalism, but let's, let's not go, go too much into that. Um, the, uh, basically, we need, we need a mix of, of, of energy types. I think, um, I had a, had a little look, the, the figures seem to vary hugely. I did, did, had a bit of a look on, on what, what the current mix is. Um, but in fact, uh, the fossil fuel doesn't seem as high as some of the Folks that were um, given here, I actually got somewhere between 36 and 43 percent of our current um, electricity comes from yeah. gas. Wind is about 24 to 26 percent. Um, solar is only four percent, and it's unlikely to be a, a huge contributor in, in, in the UK uh, at any point. Um, I think coal. I thought that did interest me. That's down to two or to three percent. When of course coal used to be a really major part of, of our output, I do think it's rather unforgivable that we've we've made that shift. But uh, again, perhaps we can discuss that a bit, a bit in the uh, in the wider discussion. Nuclear. Um, I was interested that you promoted nuclear. I'm 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 a big fan of nuclear. We currently produce about sixteen percent of our electricity with nuclear. Um, it's massively reduced, actually. Um, at its height in the late 90s, we were producing twice as much uh, electricity through nuclear. And again, I think it's unforgivable that we've got to this point. I remember arguing this, you know, well, over 20 years ago and, and consistently over the years that we should be building nuclear plants and they just haven't done it. I mean, so as will be 1995, I believe, was the last one to be built, um, which is a ridiculously long time ago. Um, this lack of infrastructure, um, commitment to building infrastructure, I think is something that we really need to look at. And, and I work in the water sector and I'm making the same arguments about reservoirs and, and, and so on. You see this, the same issues coming up. Um, I think nuclear, I mean, it's expensive, obviously, to, to get it off the ground, um, but it, it, it pays for itself, obviously, in, in the long run. I think the um, recent developments with the, the small modular reactors are certainly very interesting. Um, I think you can commission these much, much more quickly. These are small reactors. You basically build them in a factory and, and they can be made in a couple of years as opposed to the sort of decade that it takes, it takes to build these big reactors. This seems to me to be a way forward. And 
Oh, okay. Um, and I do know that there are currently they're looking at designs that are going to increase the output. But even the ones that we have now, I mean, you can um, power a big city with, with just one of these these small modular reactors. So um, they, they really are something to take very seriously. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. No. So, thanks a lot. That's fine. Okay, to round off the opening remarks, uh, Laurie. Thank you very much. Um, let me, as a point of fact, the reason why uh, renewables are cheaper to install, but the cost of them at the moment is expensive, like our gas, is, is, is a peculiarity of how electricity markets work. The most expensive thing sets the price. So that's just a, your question, James, at the very beginning, that's the answer to that question. So we could reform those markets and then the true cost of renewables, which is nothing after you've built the thing, would then be reflected in that price. And I think this goes to the deep point, which is that it's very rare in policymaking to get win, genuine win-wins, right? Where you have a policy and all policies have certain trade-offs. There'll always be costs associated with policies, but to get a situation where there's like a win-win where you're able to tick a number of boxes at the same time is a very rare occurrence. And amazingly, amazingly, we are now in a situation with energy systems where we, we are faced with that kind of win-win, right? Um, in fact, it's not just a win-win, it's a win-win-win-win-win at the moment, right? So first win, cost of living crisis, okay? The reason why we are suffering from high energy prices in this country is not because there's a globalist cabal that's pushing net zero down our throats and that means that suddenly our prices have all shot up or we've got rid of coal and naturally the price has gone up. However much it can look like that sometimes is because there's not enough gas going around the world, basically because of two things. One, the impacts coming off the back of COVID lockdowns have shot prices up and then Vladimir Putin's choice to invade Ukraine and start to choke off gas supplies, right? So if we were in a situation where we could, um, we could literally and figuratively insulate ourselves against those fossil fuel markets, we would not be suffering as much as we are right now with a high cost of living. We wouldn't be completely immune. There would still be high prices for things, but we would be in a much better situation. And over the last 12 years, or a bit less than 12 years ago, when David Cameron, in all his wisdom, decided to cut the green crap, it meant that we didn't install as much insulation in buildings, which meant that we were further exposed to these fossil fuel energy prices. So if we are installing insulation and we are making sure that we're disconnected from these wild fossil fuel markets, we would be better, we would be in a better situation when it comes to cost of living. That's win number one. Win number two is the climate crisis. Um, it, it, that is extraordinarily bad and the greatest threat to so many things, our society, our health, ultimately the future of the planet. And if we don't get on top of it, then, well, we go further down the carbon highway to hell. So that's your second win. The third one is health. The cost, it's estimated that the costs of replacing fossil fuels globally, you know, paying for all the stuff, all the building, all the power plants, would be offset just, just by the savings made from getting rid of the health costs of the pollution coming out of coal power plants, basically. So all the cost of replacing all of the fossil fuel stuff with renewable stuff, right, is about the same as what we estimate the cost to society of the health impacts of fossil fuels. So that's the third win, the health win. And that's one example of a number of ways in which you get health benefits here. The fourth is, the fourth win is the economic win. There are vast profits, jobs, high quality jobs, um, you know, innovative investment opportunities and so on, just basically sitting around. I mean, just efficiency savings, but having buildings run better and so on. These would be hugely beneficial things to our economy. So the fourth one is economic. And then the fifth win of the win, 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 win is that they're popular. People don't want fracking in this country. Some people may want fracking in this country, but people want wind in this country. Polling shows that a majority of people, a super majority of people want wind in this country. 81% want solar in some of the latest polling, right? When contrary to the popular wisdom that is pushed through the press and so on, when you, when you have onshore wind farms near you, your support for them goes up. 
it's not not in my backyard. It's, oh, it's in my backyard, and actually I don't mind it that much anymore. And those things run against the grain of what we think, right? Our conventional wisdom that we've picked up along the way. But they're very popular as well. So we are in an extraordinary situation where we've not just got a win-win, we've got a win-win-win-win-win-win. And I think it's about time that we fully steered into that situation. Um, and there ends my opening remarks. Yeah, great, thanks so much. <laughs> okay, we've some great opening remarks. But in a way, we've still barely scratched the surface. Of, we've, set, we've set out some of the positions moving on the environmental things. I'm still particularly interested in the, um, you might call technical question. Like how are we going to get enough? How is that actually going to happen? Why is it taking us so long to address it? Those kind of things. What would actually need to change? But I'm sure the audience also have plenty of other things. So I'll just start with the first person I saw, which was that gentleman over there. I think the carbon capture and storage, don't be so pessimistic because BP did this in the Ansala field in Algeria in the 1990s. So it's not a new technology. It's been around for almost 30 years. Um, in terms of the fracking, it's interesting because amongst all my friends, I'm probably the most pro-fracker that anyone knows. And yet, I think it's a waste of time here in the UK. A number of reasons. One, we don't have the drilling infrastructure they have in the US. We have probably 10 rigs. They have tens of thousands in the US. Secondly, we have a much higher population density than they have in the Permian Basin. So seriously, you're limited. That also reflects the fact that they're often in, in, in nice national parks. You had to put lots of roads in to build that infrastructure because fracking, you're not drilling a well that lasts 20 years. You're having to drill 200. Eight out of 10 of them won't produce economic gas. And those that do only last for a couple of years. So you're having to do factory drilling, a shitload of drilling. And last but not least, in the US, if, if they drill on your land, you get 12.5% of the value of gas. So you're, you're overnight a multimillionaire. Now, I'm sure that would solve a lot of problems here in the UK, except our friends in, in Action UK, or whatever it has, probably, probably would object to a series of billionaires being created overnight once you pay them 12.5% royalty. Two technologies that, that haven't been mentioned here and that even a few years ago was probably seen as all science fiction, but which now appear to be getting some official recognition of real possibilities are space energy, the large solar stations orbiting, and nuclear fusion. Uh, what's the view of the panel on these? Are they, are they the technologies of the future, or are they the technologies of the future that always will be in the future? Three quick uh, questions. Uh, one is on the fracking. My concern with fracking is the chemicals that get injected in and what that does to water and water pollution. So I'd, I'd like to know that. I don't know. But that's my major um, concern about fracking. Um, secondly, in terms of energy, nobody's mentioned thorium. And I once sat next to the key nuclear um, physicist person of America on a plane for 10 hours and asked him why thorium wasn't used in the US. And he said, well, it should be, but the nuclear lobby is so powerful that we've shut down thorium. So why has nobody mentioned thorium? And my uh, third very brief question is, I've just met somebody who's developing a quantum battery uh, in conjunction with some university in the US. Have you guys heard about the quantum battery? And if so, any comments? Just from the International Energy Agency, and this is globally, coal is 26%. Oil, 29%. Natural gas, 24%. Nuclear, 5%. Renewables are 16%, but 11% of that 16% is wood. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, now, it, we know that were fracking to be successful in Europe, it would, drop the, it would drop the price of gas. Why do we know that? Because in America, they successfully dropped the price of... Well, They've, they've shielded themselves from the much of the increase that we've experienced um, because Obama started shale gas big time. Trump continued it. Biden's trying to row back, but he probably won't last too long. So it, and, and, that, and the prices are different over in America than it is in Europe. So if we successfully did it here, the price would drop. One of the reasons um, Putin's invaded Ukraine is there's loads of natural gas in the Black Sea. It doesn't get mentioned very often. But I think the problem is, is if you're going to go to net zero, you have to go to nuclear, if you're going to do it. I think it's a rubbish idea. But if you're going to do it, you have to go to nuclear. We can't do it fast enough, according to the alarmist narrative. So the way to get to nuclear has to be gas. So we go gas to nuclear. And while we're doing all that, 
we can prove that two members of this panel are complete, talking complete rubbish. <laughs> well, wow, so throwing the gauntlet down. Anyway, uh, so uh, James. Well, I'm delighted that Laurie from the IPPR, if I'm not mistaken, wants to invoke Stephen Covey, the seven ha habits of effective people, five times in his win, 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 win situation. Uh, you know, to believe that uh, if only the market was reformed, that um, a renewables prices really would be as cheap as the carbon brief mendaciously maintained, uh, really is stretching credulity. You know, what renewables cost a lot to make, they cost a lot to run, they cost a lot to dispose of, they cost a lot to add to the grid, they cost a lot to, uh, to back up on the grid. And still we are led, led the mythology, uh, given the mythology, that they are nine times cheaper than gas. You know, it's just, it just cannot be credited, uh, that, that whole idea. And, you know, similarly, what can't be credited is the ridiculous metaphor that by insulating our homes, we can insulate ourselves from fossil fuel prices. You know, that's, that verb is carrying quite a lot of weight there, Laurie, I think you'd admit. And the fact is that insulating British homes, if the American experience is anything to go by, would take 33 years. And you don't have to be a climate alarmist to say, climate alarmist, to say that that's a fairly slow timescale. Insulation is not going to fix our energy problems. Massive new supplies of energy, especially in Africa, that needs to industrialize, are what the world needs. And what I want to know from Laurie and Tom Heap is, do you or do you not favor the industrialization of Africa? If you do, do you see any role for fossil fuels in that? Because if you want to set yourself up against the leaders of African states and African people and still go by the United Nations rubber band kind of solar lamp in your mud hut, you know, as energy access and the future for Africans, then I really can't be on your bus. Because as far as I'm concerned, Africans deserve everything that we have in energy. And any further attempts by John Kerry or the Europeans or Putin or China to try to stop their development and stop their investment in fossil fuels carry a big amount of racial stigma in them as far as I'm concerned. Okay, right. Isn't it nice to show your appreciation, but let's keep the conversation flowing. It's boring, we have to stop everyone. Right, right. stop. <laughs> um, I've done films about uh, solar lights in mud huts in Africa, and I can't tell you how much it changes someone's life enormously. It is a huge jump from having no light, candle light. Yeah. Radical. Um, to having a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> To having back to what you're saying. To, to having solar light. So that is it's a huge uh, jump there. <laughs> but that is that is a huge difference. Um, I am massively in favour of the economic development of Africa. Whether I'd term it industrialisation is a slightly loaded term. And I, I no, come on. I do let him speak. And I do believe that a lawful lot of that can be achieved through uh, renewable energy. I'm not entirely opposed to gas as what they used to be used to be known as a bridging fuel because it does emit much less carbon dioxide than some other uh, fossil fuel. So I don't think that's in, in entirely wrong. And I, the, we are just briefly about fracking. Well, I think it's a bit of an irrelevance for a lot of the reasons we heard here. It's never gonna make a big difference. But I am slightly sympathetic to the argument that says, if you use gas in your home and in your industry, then it's possible that you should own the environmental impact of that in your own country and take responsibility for it rather than just import it from elsewhere in the world. Now, uh, to a couple of the questions, um, uh, uh, thorium and, and, and nuclear, oh, the gentleman mentioned, sorry, um, there is uh, stuff in space. I think stuff in space is probably, if you'll forgive me, nonsense. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen economically for a very long time. Fusion has been 30 years hence for as long as I've been in the uh, reporting on this issue. And um, thorium, I, I don't know about the specifics, but one thing I would say is in a funny way, the nuclear world is quite innovation averse. So once it has a technology which it kind of knows how to manage, it does like to stick to it. So you could well be right about thorium because there's a sort of better the devil you know thing going on with nuclear. Uh, we, in, in my book and series, we looked at something about uh, molten salt reactors, which are another way of cooling as opposed to using water. And once again, the feeling was there, it's quite difficult to get innovation because uh, 
you, 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 as I say, better the devil you know, and that can militate against a change. No, thanks, Tom. Really helpful. Casper, some remark. Um, yeah, I want to know which two of the, the panel. That's <laughs> ridiculous. <Yeah. laughs> um, anyway, um, I'm utterly for the industrialization of Africa, I must say, but I guess you knew that, James, because you, you didn't call me out on that one. Um, the, uh, I think the, the idea of the solar lamps, well, of course, it's, it's, it makes a massive difference if you have absolutely nothing, but that's not what we're calling for for the people of Africa, um, just slightly more than absolutely nothing. I, mean, I think we actually want them to have the sort of living standard that we have here um, in, in a developed country like, like the UK. Um, fusion, I was going to make the same point. It's always 30 years away. I can't work this out because it was, it was 30 years away um, 20 years ago. Um, so, well, I've looked at it recently and they are still saying 30 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> boils uh, I, I wish it would be tomorrow because it'd be great, but, uh, but it, it doesn't look as if it's going to be. Um, I, I have to call out the net zero stuff because it's such a load of nonsense. Next era is not going to solve any problems. If, if the climate science is correct, net zero is not going to solve that problem anyway. So why the obsession with, with that? We actually ought to be looking at different sorts of solutions if we're actually interested in solving the problem of climate change. And net zero is not it, so, so let's stop obsessing about it. Oh, thanks. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... No, I don't think anyone here is saying that people in Africa shouldn't have access to abundant energy um, and that the way they'll get access to abundant energy is through a mix of renewable energy, probably some fossil fuels, maybe with some CCS, something like that. I mean, right now, what we've got here, got an app, tells me what, where our electricity is coming from. 63% is zero carbon right now in this country. Uh, so, you know, I'd love it if Africa, people in Africa... That's how electricity that access. Is. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. here. So the National Grid has an app. Well, National Grid ESO, you know, any one time you can check where our electricity is coming from. And yes. right now, the biggest source is wind at 29%, solar 17%, nuclear is 15%, water is 2%, um, and gas is 17%. Uh, so that's pretty good. And we are, you know, and we are in a bridge, we are in a bridge moment, right? Gas is, we are in that bridge thing. Uh, that's why gas is still in that mix. And it was going all right until fossil fuel markets went haywire globally. And that's one of the reasons why we're suffering at the moment. Um, but it was, the plan was to have gas as a, as a bridge to then bridge us over to other fuel types. And, you know, in some ways we are going through that process. Um, and then on the net zero thing, I think like, we need to be really clear about this, right? Like net, the concept of, there's the scientific concept of net zero, which is, um, it's, a, it's a balance between um, what's called sources and sinks, right? So sources of CO2, like cars, power plants, and so on, right? Burning stuff, etc. And then sinks, the places where that's absorbed. Now that's CO2, some of it's absorbed in the atmosphere, some of it's absorbed into the seas, some of it's absorbed by plants, right? The concept of net zero is just that there is a balance between the stuff that's coming out and the stuff that's getting absorbed. So the balance is zero, right? So you've got 100 units of carbon being burnt coming out, and then there's enough trees and atmosphere and stuff to absorb that. And we want to get us down to the point where we've got that balance, and that's how you stop the climate problem. The concept of net zero as a target in policy is then related to that, right? So who here was, who, who here is frustrated with net zero or agrees with what we were just hearing about net zero? Be, be honest, you know. When, and I, and I actually, I really want to hear why people think it's a load of rubbish. So when we go back around in a second, please, people, I would love to hear why people think that. Can I also ask, put your hands up. Yeah, we'll do that. Can I put your hands up if you were similarly frustrated or you felt the same about the targets that existed before the net zero target? Because there was one. Were you annoyed about that? Put your hand up. Why, can, I, can I ask you, so why were you annoyed with that? What was the target? No, no, why no, this, you... this has come out of oh. dollars or whatever. But... Okay. but I want to hear, yeah, I want to hear why people were annoyed with the previous okay. target, what that target was and why they were annoyed okay. with that. I'm going to... I disagree with that because we got a whole panel on net zero in a couple oh, of hours' time. So people can come back and they can I didn't do... get invited to that one. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 please I'll, come. I'll reserve, Sorry, your, please come. I'll reserve your front row seat. Okay. okay? So, so net zero, let's deal with that some other time. Oh. Oh. It's kind of inevitable, right? But I want to talk about yeah. energy. Laurie, Laurie used the term abundance. Yeah. 
Where's that going to come from? How are we going to get to abundance? My, my point to make here is it's kind of connected, but it's a bit broader. Um, where's a democracy in what we're talking about here in terms of uh, alternative energy, net zero, and so on? So I'll give you an example. Um, my council, Islington Labour, uh, they call it a climate deficit. They call it that we, and I live there as well, we're in a climate emergency. Basically, what that means in reality is that you have no choice but to accept every single measure they're going to impose, which is LTNs, um, uh, uh, school-friendly st streets, but also tree planting, you know, removal of cars and so on, and finding alternative sources of energy. I think for ordinary people, that's reality, what we're, we're talking about here. There is no democracy. And of course, if you question it, then you're, you're you know, labelled a, perhaps a denier and all the rest of it. So there's no kind of debate... I think encourage it's more just widespread acceptance and also, of course, a change of your behaviour. If you don't, then you're uh, really the problem. If you don't insulate your houses where you think you should, you're the issue. And I, so that I, that's the point I'd like to make here is that I don't think there's any there's real democracy in any of this discussion about you know alternatives. How much is it going to cost us physically? Cost us in money to get to net zero yeah. until we get a badge at the end. <laughs> you get to live. And how long have we cost? How much has it already cost us in monetary terms, please? I perhaps took the title of the session a bit more literally. I would actually like to hear a bit more about fracking. I don't really know anything about it. I want to hear from the panel what what is fracking? Is that a, possibly one of the solutions for the UK? What are what are the pros? What are the cons? I just want to hear a bit more about it and what what the solutions could be for the UK. We, we've heard some discussion on the panel about what the actual percentage of wind power goes to make up the energy budget. And you hear this confusion also with politicians, and they say, oh, 40% of our energy is wind. You know, one big push, and we'll get to the ceiling. Laurie told us about his app. You know, 18% of our energy comes from wind. My understanding is that's only buildings and heating, and that's only one quarter of the energy pie. So we've still got all this energy to make up for agriculture, industry, and vehicles that we're not going to get there by windmills. So, you know, we hear these figures about 40% from wind power. That's just the building heating. And politicians are similarly confused by this. I doubt any of them go to a discussion like the one we're having about how much energy we need, how we're going to produce one petawatt hours from the different mixes of things we've got. I'm not for or against ideologically any particular form of energy, but I do despair when we're told, not by anyone on the panel, but by some influences in energy that we can get there by solar, which has got you know, very low efficiency. Someone talked about thorium and the conservatism of the, of the nuclear industry came out on the panel. That's absolutely true. So in this country, if you've got an engineering or physics degree and you want to convert to working in the nuclear industry. You can do this conversion MSc. Practically the only thing you can study on that MSc, which is offered by a consortium of British universities, is decommissioning. So if you go to the place, what you can do is learn how to shut power plants down. So they're not looking at things like novel fuels and chemistries, thorium. They're not looking at things like sulfur cooling. And I, I, I don't know how we get the politicians to hear that, in a sense, they're being deprived of the information they need to make decisions about how we're going to produce the energy we need. Brilliant. Love that contribution. Well done. Uh, OK, pass that, microphone, pass that microphone to the guy who's going to tell us exactly why he hates whatever came before net zero. I was kind of interested in Casper's uh, point when he said we don't like any form of energy. I think that's an important point. But I do want to challenge the point about the wind power. So I don't come from this country. I'm only here for the weekend. I come from Germany. Germany has a lot of wind power. And I don't really believe people in Britain really want this because people in Germany don't want it. Um, people in Germany, I, I've just come back from a demonstration. I've just seen demonstrations against wind power because people are sort of making the point that they are increasing social rifts within society. It's not true that alternative energy, the, 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 the kind of um, the burden is, is e uh, equally distributed amongst po the population. No, because it's the poorer people who get the wind power. It's the, it's, it, it leads to a rift between country and city. Um, people are now saying we need 2% of our ground just for wind power. What does this mean? You know, people are really shocked by what that means. 2%, that's, that's a huge amount of wind power. 
So, um, you know, I, I really don't think people will want it in Britain. I don't think they want it in Germany, but just, just to make that point. Thank you. I'll, a I'll answer why uh, I was before the, yeah, against the targets previously. I remember the um, Climate Change Act 2008. And effectively what it did is it, is it, is it refocused the British energy market away from uh, cheap, reliable energy, a competitive market. Remember, privatization happened early 90s. Massive dash for gas. North Sea oil gas opened up. We saw energy uh, production increase from something like 63,000 uh, 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 megawatts to something like 85. The Climate Change Act came in and it went down. We're now about 63. So when we're saying we need more energy, more electricity, we've actually destroyed the electricity producing market. That's why I'm against it. Because what it did is it took away from <clears throat> producing energy and letting free market private capital competition at no cost to us produce that energy for us. It then said it's about carbon reduction, not about energy production, about carbon reduction. And it created carbon budgets every five years and a whole plethora of things that destroyed the energy market in the country. Uh, renewables, obligations, uh, emissions, trading, carbon budgets, all of that stuff. I mean, we should have like, an entire se session on how they destroyed the energy market. The one thing they latched on, because the technology isn't there to do it either, they latched on to wind. So they hugely subsidized wind. And it's really interesting. Anyone that says wind, is, James is absolutely right. It is not cheaper. When they, the, 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 the first big offshore wind farm was Hornsey One. They did contracts for difference, which is basically minimum pricing at £145 per megawatt hour. At that time, gas was between 40 and 45. So it's three and a half times the price, guaranteed minimum pricing. The new wind farms that have come on board, Hornsey 2, East Moray has just come on board. And interestingly, they agreed con contract for difference. E East Moray was, I think it's 67 pounds. They said it's gone down from 140 odd to 67. Still, that's massively above gas, the gas price was. But what's interesting is they've never taken up that CFD option. Why? Because they can get, they can also match the gas price. It's a floor pricing. So East Moray's come on board, it's cheaper. It's not, they're charging 300 pound a megawatt hour right now. Oh, and by the way, if you turn the wind farms off because there's too much, they get paid 60 pounds a megawatt hour for not producing anything. So what are they doing? They're taking money when they're producing it at the highest rate they can. They're taking money for not producing any, any energy. And now they're building batteries just on shore because they'll get paid for not producing. It's not actually not producing, it's paid for not putting it into the grid. So they can still keep the turbines going around. They'll charge the batteries up, take the 60 quid, and then take the 67 when that's released back into the grid. Okay, good. Hi, yeah, right. So um, I think for me, I, I feel very skeptical out of, uh, skeptical about energy. I don't know what I can believe. So when I see something like France, and I see over the last few decades they've had between sort of like 75% and 90% nuclear power, and then I hear they've got some of the cheapest energy prices in Europe, it seems to be a very persuasive argument that they've got something that really works. And I think that um, I, 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 I've been very... Uh, doubted wind a lot, but I have seen it get a lot better. I've seen it get a lot more economical. And I suppose I'd like to see that argument in the same way. Is there like a small island or a community? Is there, is there a place where you can point to and say, look, they're powered by wind and it's really working for them. The intermittency issues, they've solved them in a particular manner. Is there sort of like a, a pilot for wind that you could show me to persuade me? Is there any thoughts on green hydrogen? as a potential uh, generate hydrogen using electro electrolysis. So you could, that could solve the intermittency problem of renewables and it can be off grid, it can be remotely deployed. So just curious if anyone on the panel have any comments on that. Um, let me just uh, specifically answer the question about the cost of net zero. So I was trying to, f there's the, the government body that looks into this stuff, I can't find the exact cost that they're estimating in the report, so sorry, but the, I've got one here from um, the London School of Economics. Um, which has a cost. So the, the net zero transition is estimated to cost a maximum of 2% of UK GDP. So that as a figure, so if you take UK GDP, it's what, 1.7 trillion or something? No. Something like that. Something like that? So 2%, so yeah, like that. Um, so what's that? Yeah, so 2% of that figure, right? But then we have to cost us already to do 
I don't know. So, the, the, let's presume that, if I may, let's presume the intent was rhetorical. It's expensive. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. but, yeah. But then it has to. No, I don't think. Okay, so that's, that's, set, that's the point of the question. Yeah, yeah, but then you set it against the benefits, right? Yeah, like yeah, me, me going to school or going to university or even getting up in the morning costs, right? But then I get benefits. You know, me traveling here costs, and then I get the benefit of chatting with all you guys today, right? So you set it against the benefits, and the benefits are. Um, the benefits to health, the benefits of potential cheaper energy, and of course, the massive benefit of avoiding, playing our part in avoiding the huge damages that come from the climate crisis. So um, the, 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 those costs could be as much as 7.4% of GDP, according to this estimate. So you're getting a net gain of about 4% of GDP. And even that is misleading because that, that's, a, that's a way of like estimating... Um, the cost of the economy of more floods and heat waves and so on. What it doesn't do is estimate uh, potential um, extreme events could occur. So there's this massive thing called the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, the AMOC, AMOC, um, which basically moves heat and pressure around the Atlantic, right? The, the chances of that collapsing, breaking down, just abruptly stopping working are increasing hugely. It has weakened by about 15% since 1950. Some modeling done the, only, uh, the other day in the university department I'm attached to looked at what would happen if that circulation collapsed. If it collapsed, it would basically eradicate the ability to do arable farming in this country because it would mess up precipitation cycles, it, how rain falls and things like this. So that's not in that figure. So the, 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 the cost weighed against the benefit is an absolute win, basically. Okay. Good, great point. That's uh, uh, James. Space energy. I'm all for it. Casper's uh, wrong about fusion. There are a number of recent developments in the past year or two to making it much more like a 10 or 15 year prospect than a 30 year prospect. <laughs> well, you can laugh, but you know, the way that we're hearing from Laurie and I fear Casper is that they'll be repeating it's 30 years away when it's that. actually, uh, well, I don't know, it's mistaken, I think. I'm, I'm um, I got a degree in physics, and I'm all I'm all for thorium. Well, that's give me uh, my thorium. I've got a degree in physics, <laughs> and that's so why that you, think, you don't need a would, degree in physics. No, 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 you don't. No, 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 it's not what it was. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, um, yeah, you know, fusion is is on the cards. India's doing quite well with thorium. I pass on quantum batteries. Uh, direct current transmission has far fewer transmission losses than alternating current. We're going to get some from Germany fairly soon, uh, if Germany still exists. And I, uh, uh, I, I, I do believe that wind uh, technologically is improving. Right? They, they, what, what sustainable people go on about the learning curve, they think it's confined to renewables. Now, I'm all in favor of gearless wind turbines. I'm all in favor of making myself a cup of coffee with an espresso machine in the nacelle, look it up, look it up, uh, of, a, uh, of a wind turbine. But to imagine that this does not go on in uh, a fossil fuel sector, that there are no technological improvements there, is quite ridiculous. If you look at the, shacking, uh, the fracking industry uh, and shale in America, it's a high-tech industry, lots of debt, but a lot of IT up the nose of their drilling. And we shouldn't call it fracking, which refers to the fracturing of rocks by um, breaking them apart vertically. What we should be referring to is the productivity benefits of horizontal drilling, where you're able to access a lot more gas and oil than you would be by normal, simple vertical drilling. And therefore, we're using the wrong word. And I hear all the objections which are uh, eloquently voiced about uh, fracking in Britain. We know that the seismic conditions or population conditions, the aquifers, uh, the transport movements, there's a, you can do salami tactics on fracking, uh, you know, and you can get 20 pieces of salami. But what the critics of fracking won't admit is that basically what they're saying is because of all of these pieces of salami, no experimentation, exploration, or seismic trials are possible in Britain today. We will not do it. We will not try to get around those geological conditions because it's just beyond the pale, you know? And that, that ain't science, folks. Now, well, if I may conclude, okay, Chair, yeah, the, the, when, uh, Laurie, we're gonna have to have a beer, Laurie. Um, <laughs> when, when, Never heard that said so ominously. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll compare physics degrees. It's, 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 
it's catastrophe approaches <laughs> and apocalyptic fear. But you know, it's all very well. And you know, I love the youth. I love Laurie because you know, you get an app. It's by the National Grid, who you can really rely on, and it says, you know. Uh, they're the ones who are promising three-hour power cuts this winter, right? Because they, did, they did the sum. So they, you get you get the app, and it says, "Oh, today, you know, renewables are responsible for forty percent." Well, you know, there's a thing called the year. Stumps the shake in the paper. Sorry, I'm getting agitated here. The the there's a thing called the year, Laurie. And generally speaking, when we're talking about electricity supply, just there's an app for that. Doesn't quite hack. How much electricity we're getting okay. out of renewables okay. over the year, not just this Good. moment. Tom, uh, just on the cost of the of uh, whether it's net zero or basically our shift away from the carbon-based energy, even if it is two p two percent of GDP, which seems to be at the upper end, two p in the pound to save the world seems like a banging deal to me. I'm quite happy to pay that. Um, on the uh, what is fracking? Fracking refers to hydraulic fracturing of rock. It is the uh, pumping in of water under great pressure and uh, with other chemicals and, the, and also turning the, the kind of, it was actually, the innovation was a kind of a drilling which allowed you to turn corners uh, deep underground and then uh, fracture that rock to enable you to get gas from where it was much more diffuse than normal gas wells. Um, there are issues about the chemicals that are used in that water. The belief is that they're used sufficiently deeply to not get into the drinking water table. That is, of course, debated by some, but that is what the debate is over the uh, uh, safety of or one of the debates, safety of fracking. And the thing about um, seismicity was not so much that it was a danger to people's homes, but it might be a danger to the integrity of the well and the drilling uh, itself in terms of uh, earthquakes. Uh, just picking up on a couple of other ones. Um, uh, gas has been cheap. It's clearly not cheap now. Um, and one of the reasons it was cheap, I referred to my argument earlier, that we were not paying the full cost of the gas. If you're not paying to clean something up, you are not paying for its full cost, and you're just letting it drop like throwing litter into the street, and that, frankly, is infantile. Um, if you want an island, someone said, is there somewhere where yeah. they've got... Um, yeah, the wind example, yeah. The wind example. Um, Orkney is the closest you're going to get at the moment. Have a look at what they're doing up there. It's not perfect by any means, but they're trying to use excess wind to generate green hydrogen when they've got it that they then put in vehicles and they use in people's homes. It is a very interesting microcosm of what could happen around the rest of the country. So all needs the uh, uh, one to look at there. Um, uh, I've got quite a lot of renewables. Uh, I've got um, solar thermal. That's the one that heat your water. Look a bit like fluorescent tube in your house. I've also got some solar panels. And yes, I do have on some of them the embarrassingly good deal that was offered at the start of this, um, which yes is an extraordinary large amount of you know amount of money now. Um, it really is quite something. Um, but it was a pump priming exercise back then. It got people who were lucky enough to have a bit of spare money to invest in it. And yes, that was me to do it and get the whole thing rolling. So uh, whilst it's a lot of money now, I don't. It was necessarily unreasonable. I've also put some in recently with no subsidy. <coughs> Panels were a lot cheaper, and they still make very cheap electricity. So the idea that renewables don't make re uh, um, cheap electricity is just factually wrong. All around to Tom's house this winter, then, I think. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, I, I guess one of the things I'm, I was thinking about is innovation, because we haven't really talk, talked much about that with you know, we've talked about fusion and, and thorium and so on, but I'm always really hopeful about the future. I, I, I'm always surprised by by new innovations. You know, you actually think, I mean, lithium wasn't even a resource when I was a child, you know, and yet we're using it in absolutely everything and we're all carrying it around in our phones and so on. Um, so, you know, battery technologies, storage technologies, um, I imagine that things are going to be vastly different in 30 years by the time we've got fusion. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so I'm always hopeful about the, those things. Uh, I think to, just just briefly on the on the um, earthquakes and stuff. I, I think um, you know that's one of the fears with the hydraulic fracturing. Um, the likelihood is actually that they're, they're you know they're about up, up to maybe three percent on the Richter scale, which is probably three, three, uh, three sorry, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, which uh, 
is sort of the equivalent of if a truck goes past in the street. Is it, you, you'd feel it at about that level. It, it, these aren't sort of big, big earthquakes that we're talking about. And in fact, um, coal mining uh, is caused more earthquakes than hydraulic fracture in these cases likely to. And of course, we had hundreds of years of that. Um, so it, yeah, it's just just to put that in, in okay, context. Okay, one more text. Um, okay, I'm just 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 briefly about the climate emergency because I do think just about this demo democracy point, you know, calling it emergency, um, I, I really object to it. Um, I, I actually believe that the climate science, most of it is, is correct. I'm not sure about all the models, but, but nevertheless. But, I, I, but calling it emergency immediately invokes a lack of democracy, and I think that's really problematic. First of all, that uh, Germany spent, I think, half a trillion on their clean energy program, and their carbon footprint is about the same as what it was before because ideologically they shut down their nuclear power stations and started using coal. So you also need to factor in government and competence. No. Uh, <laughs> and and um, as far as uh, what <clears throat> um, the UN asked 10 million people uh, across the world what was important to them, the right rank 16 things, and climate was at the bottom. At the top is education, health, jobs, no corruption, nutrition, no violence, clean water. So I think as people have been saying, you know, globally, and we need to solve this globally, people want to become wealthy like we are first, and then they'll worry about clean energy. So, you know, I think what we need to be spending more money on innovation and looking at how we can make a, um, a clean energy grid that actually you know, works at 99.99% reliability. So it's not, yeah. you know, wind and, and solar are cheap because they're, but it's the role building in the reliability into the grid that costs the extra money. So if you just look at the cost of having a windmill turning and the solar panel and no controls around it, then, you know, you're really not capturing the full cost of okay. I'd just like to say some correction from what uh, I've heard people say. Um, I want to go through some of my understandings here. Um, I don't see the need of why we need fusion whenever molten salt reactors, which is fission, has already been proven to work. Alvin Weinberg in the 1960s in Oak Ridge had the molten salt reactor, and that ran for four years. It worked. It, all the results proved that it was infallible. It didn't melt down. So there is the, the science proves it. So I don't see why we're debating fusion. Another thing I'd like to say is that I am, um, I'll be honest here, as I can, I was actually in convincing before COVID struck for climate change. And I'll say, I don't think the government elites have it in our interest with climate change. It is very, um, the sense is not confirmed. We are, to me, I personally think it's quasi-religious. Before the Flood was a recent movie that Leonardo DiCaprio starred in. That almost sounds like Noah's Ark to me. So I want to say I am pro carbon dioxide. I think, for example, the fact that scientists don't call it the fact that CO2 being up to 1,100 parts per million is peak for plant growth. High CO2 in the atmosphere means higher yields of food growing, higher yields of carbon products growing, higher productivity, and a higher economy. So I really do not trust the science, so-called, of climate change. And I think let's have more technology about fossil fuels and biogas. You see, Germany, for example, they have really pioneered the biogas industry. So where is the talk about that? Right, okay. Um, it's been said in this room that um, oil and gas extraction are intrusive and dirty. And, you know, uh, I, can you indulge me while I read this out? It's really quite short. Right, as long as it's, it's not a, so long. It's a description of a place in the UK. There are more species of animals and plants within a 10-mile radius of Wareham than anywhere in the country. Seeker and roe deer hide in the forest. Hundreds of species of birds reside there, including the internationally protected nightjar and the Dartford warbler, along with six species of nascent British reptiles, 33 breeding butterflies, dragonflies, 500 types of moths, and 500 flowering plants. The bay that Sandbanks overlooks is a marine conservation area. RSPB Arn, that's what they're talking about, is officially the most biodiverse region in the UK. So Sandbanks, I've been on a little tourist trip in Sandbanks. I don't know where if you've been there. It is the, where the most some of the most expensive property in the UK is. I can't afford to live there. Footballers live there. 
uh, John Lennon bought his Auntie Mimi property there. The property prices are you know, 12 million pounds, right? What is it also host to? It's the host to the largest gas and oil extraction facility in Western Europe. And nobody knows in this room. Who, who knew it was there? If you, built, if you built fracking facilities four miles away from my house, I wouldn't know it was there. The session asks, how can we stop rises in the first place, such rises in the first place, and our new television horizon like nuclear fusion? And there's been two interesting comments that I've picked up on around essentially public policy. Someone said politicians don't go to discussions like this that focus on the details. And we also need to factor in government incompetence in how we got here. So how did we get here? Um, where, as we've already discussed, we haven't built any nuclear reactors or at least you know, put them live for the last 27 years. Uh, and how do we enable politicians, civil servants, and anyone interested in or involved in public policy to make better decisions for us, people like us? And I will say to Tom, who I'm, I'm actually a big fan of, anyone who says save the planet or end of the world, um, I find less difficult, quite difficult to take seriously because what does an unsaved planet look like? Well, it looks like the planet today. And in this planet today, there are many people who live terrible lives because of the climate, because of lack of development and so on. So people who talk about save the world actually relativize today to being an okay situation. And it's not okay. It's not okay if you live in Bangladesh or sub-Saharan Africa, many parts of Asia still. A save the world just sounds to me like a kind of, you know, Tom's been talking about being infantile. It's a bit of a childish trope in my view. So it's just a question about um, getting, so we, it sounds like we've got loads of options for energy and we're developing some of them to some extent and we, some people want to do more of one and some people want more of another. What are the actual barriers? I mean, we heard about nuclear from the gentleman that you know, only studied decommissioning. That's okay, I understand. So there's some kind of political, there's fears around secure safety. There's a perhaps, you know, um, perhaps genuine, perhaps a bit um, over the top. But for other things, you know, why aren't we just doing more wind if it's so great? Uh, I'm not saying it's not, but why aren't we doing more? It seems to be we've got all this technology. We're talking about all these other things that might solve. Uh, but we've got loads of options already. So it's perhaps a naive question, but that's why I came to this session to understand more. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 great. I, I want to pick that up because the genesis of this session and why we framed down we did was that it's within, it's, sure, it's within our capability and has been for a long, long time to have basically unlimited energy. And we don't. And then this series of crises came along and suddenly everybody's talking about energy as if they'd never even thought before that we might be able to have literally unlimited energy. And what possibilities would that open up to society if we had unlimited energy? What scientific processes would suddenly be possible? What com computational processes would suddenly be possible? And why don't we have it? What, what, what went wrong? What got stuck? That's the kind of, the, the spirit of that question. That's why we framed this panel out. Uh, the way we did. I really want to hear what the panel has to say. So there's this lady, then there was another guy at the back. Hi, yeah, just one more question for the two guys over there. The elements that go into electric storage and electric batteries, you are aware of where that comes from and yeah. where it has to be processed. It has to go back to China to be processed. Do we really want to be reliant on China having control? You can see what's happened with Russia and the gas. Uh, there's, a, there's a few extra problems with thorium, which is why it's, why it's not being pursued um, and not many advantages over uranium so it's just a, it's an economically driven um, reason why thorium's not being um, not being pursued um, on, on the decommissioning is the only the only thing you can study there, there's plenty of innovation in the nuclear industry at the moment and decommissioning plays a large part of it because there's such a large legacy from from the 50s and from the weapons programs but there's certainly stuff that you can study beyond de decommissioning um, a quick comment on the the energy discussion more broadly i think if um, a, a good way to think of, of, of this whenever energy comes up is that energy, our energy demand is going to be split up into roughly three parts. And I would like to think roughly a third is electricity, roughly a third is heating, and roughly a third goes to locomotion, to cars and buses and things like that. It's not really a third, a third, a third, but that's a good way of thinking about it. Now, we've done quite a good job of decarbonizing the electricity third. The other two are quite tricky to decarbonize, and we need to start thinking beyond just what's going to give us some power out of the plug, we've got to start thinking about how we're going to start powering the buses and the cars around the country. Wind turbines and solar are not very good at getting something like hydrogen developed. So 
if we're going to shift to a future of hydrogen running vehicles, we need to start thinking seriously about how we're going to generate the hydrogen. On the innovation front for nuclear, for example, high temperature gas reactors are looking to be coming online a demonstrator in the early 30s, uh, 2030s. Rolls-Royce's small module reactor looks like an early like 2030s um, delivery as well. Mm -hmm. But we need to start thinking about how we're going to be de dealing with these other two big chunks, which is the vehicle fleet. That includes aviation, shipping, and, and heating. Yeah, the session was meant to be a, 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 you know, a bit more on fracking. Jim Ratcliffe, who runs Ineos, one of the two fracking companies that haven't given up on this country yet, reckons there's about 50 years worth of shale gas supplies down under Lancashire, Yorkshire, the northeast. Then it follows the North Sea, broadly follows the coal pattern, you know, down through the Ruhr Valley and what have you. There's stack loads of shale actually underneath the coal. You go another half a mile down, roughly. The, the issue is we'll never know how much could be extracted. You know, you know, populations and all the rest of it. I mean, the early fracking in, in, in the States, Fort Worth, was right next to a housing estate. You know, so this idea that it has to be out in some desert is, is a real myth. But we'll never know. And the reason we'll never know is because what they did behind the scenes, and in fact, Michael Gove is responsible for a lot of this. Um, I could say quite a lot about Michael Gove, but he's responsible for a lot behind the scenes. <laughs> but in the States, the seismic uh, tolerances that are allowed roughly go between 2.5 and 4.7 on the seismic scale depending on the different geographical locations, et cetera, et cetera. In the UK, all they did behind the scenes is turn that down and turn it down and turn it down. And it's now on 0 0.5. Now, you can't do anything on 0 0.5. You couldn't do quarrying. You couldn't build a building. You couldn't run a lorry. You couldn't do heat pump exploration. You couldn't do anything on 0 0.5. And that's how they effectively banned fracking in this country, was for that over-regulation. Gove is responsible. Order in which we spoke, which means we begin with James. I'll give you uh, two and a half minutes. Don't go too far. Mm, I won't. <laughs> Molten salt, I'm all in favour of it. Um, what I'm not in favour of, I mean, two things haven't come up, although one did a little bit. Smart meters. What? Aren't, don't they warm the cockles of your heart? You know, <laughs> they can, they can, they're only, they're going to let you be cheap. You know, and you can turn down the washing machine at night and you'll, you'll be sending power back to the national grid. Uh, and it's all going to be perfect, isn't it? Yeah, right. Same with heat pumps. You know, those rubber bands, they're not going to go wrong. They're going to be fine. They're, they're going to be cheap to install. Lord Davin of the Climate Change Committee has installed one in his house, priced £19,500. And no, he does not live in a high-rise flat. So, you know, the establishment that's given us those two things is finally, Jacob, the same establishment that the lady there so rightly focused on. If you want to be sustainable, you're going to have to accept the Chinese. And not just the Chinese, who I've got no problem with, but the Chinese Communist Party. Right? Everything that goes into an electric vehicle, and I'm in favor of electric buses and so on, everything that goes into that, everything that goes into a solar panel, everything that goes into a solar panel, and a whole lot that goes into wind turbines. Siemens just in an earlier session made 2,500 people redundant. China hasn't done that. So it's important to understand that they, the stuff that we're buying when we think it's renewable is generally produced in the Democratic Republic of Ch uh, Congo, which is not very democratic, if we're taking panels in particular. The Chinese are in Africa getting that hold of that stuff that the lady referred to. So I, once again, I ask the moral question, of our panelists, do you favor the rape of Africa in order to save the planet? Do you favor the restriction on Africa that John Kerry wants? Or do you really want the liberation of two and a half billion people? That's a question with renewables in front of us, and I've only got one answer. Okay. Tom, uh, some closing thoughts. Uh, I really don't like the misuse of the word rape. Um, on another point, uh, to your... Uh, to your point about unlimited energy, it is true that we took our eye off the ball in the West about energy. We kind of took energy for granted. That's why a lot of this stuff has been developed in China. We kind of assumed everything would be all right. I think the only source of kind of unlimited energy, as you said, it was supposedly nuclear at its time. And we got worried about that because of safety reasons. Now, whether those safety reasons are valid or not, is, is something for another session. But I think that's why we moved away from that idea of unlimited energy. Other forms of energy required 
um, exploration and damage. And just as you, uh, I, you know, absolutely agree that some of the uh, mining for rare earth metals, etc., in Democratic Republic of Congo and indeed Chile, uh, can be uh, very damaging. But let's just have a look at the damage that oil and gas did around the world for the last uh, 100 plus years, and not just environmentally, but also, of course, politically as well. Um, uh, just to the point of the uh, this gentleman's point about uh, using the phrase saving the world, saving the planet, I take that a little bit, I, I take that criticism a bit. Yes, there are a little bit of journalese in the use of that phrase. Um, having said that, there are a lot of credible scientists who believe if we continue to emit carbon dioxide at the current rate, it is an existential threat to a large, to our civilization as we currently know it. And as to the description that the sort of planet has already ended, uh, sorry, for some people on it because there's, there's poverty, that is of course true, but it's also true that there are more people living in relative wealth and comfort than there have ever been on this world. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think there is, a, you know, there is a, a good world worth saving. And just finally, um, there's been a lot of kind of negativity from the audience and from some of the panel about the idea of energy saving. I just don't get that. We've all established we wanted more energy. It would be a good idea if we didn't waste the energy we've got. And this kind of sneering attitude toward that in the room and from quite a lot of politicians, because I, I don't really know why, I find completely bizarre. It seems to me a real no-brainer that we shouldn't waste this precious stuff that we generate. And if that costs a little bit of money to not waste it, then that's money we should be paying. It seems so obvious. Okay, great. Casper. Uh, um, just just on that, I mean, I've got nothing against efficiency. I mean, I'm, I'm an engineer. You know, all of engineering tends to move towards better efficiency as, as you improve yourself. So, so the idea of wasting energy, there's no point wasting energy just for the sake of it. So they never argue for that, and you don't think to have. Um, it, it, with regard to us taking the eye off the ball, I think it's much worse than that. I, I actually think that there have been real ideological problems. There's been a critique of energy. There was a critique of nuclear. There was a critique of wind. There, you know, I alluded to this before. You know, the, the, the fact that actually there's been resistance to every, every form of energy um, instead of a celebration of it. I, I think this, this is the real problem. We could have more energy than, than we need but that that takes political will and there's been a lack, lack of that and a lack of belief in progress and a lack of belief in in our future you know you compare what the victorians did you know with, with when when they needed new infrastructure they just like did it in, in these incredibly short time periods and then, then you look at what what we've done and we, we can't build a nuclear power plant in 27 years um, so um, it, it's it's a social thing. It's got nothing to do with how much energy is available or or, or what technologies we have. It's it's a it's a political problem, and that that's the one that we've we've got to actually. That's the thing we've got to change. Oh, great! Thanks for that, Casper. Really nice way to end. Um, Laurie, um, I think that, so. If we were all at the uh, at the Battle of Ideas, seventeen twenty-two, it goes back that far, right? Um, <laughs> I can imagine we were we would be sat around and we'd be like. Some of us here would be like, look, guys, there's this new energy system, right? It's going to be based on coal. And they're going to be like, you know what, mate? You know, we're burning our wood. How on earth are you going to get this coal <laughs> stuff out of the ground? And the, what, how are you going to burn it on the scale that's needed? And, what, you know, what's this electricity stuff you're chatting about? We've got these gas lamps we've burnt, you know. And it's very hard to imagine a new energy system when you're living in the current one, right? And that's partly because a new energy system... Um, by definition, all of it hasn't been invented yet. So it's very difficult to imagine the kind of bridge <laughs> point in the future. The best available evidence shows that we probably can get to a point in the not too distant future where we are able to have a diversity of different energy supplies with many or most of them being renewable. Mm -hmm. There probably is some what's called base load, sort of baseline capacity, maybe from nuclear, hopefully from thorium. Uh, in 30 years' time. Um, and, the, and, and we have lots of efficiency in our buildings, so we're using less of it where we don't need to use that, so we're wasting less of it, right? We're not, you know, unnecessarily constraining ourselves, we're just wasting less of it. And that is doable. Now, my version of that is not one that tears Africa to pieces. It's the opposite. It's one in which the best available technologies are available to people in Africa and not with the horrific loans and other conditions that usually come with 
the, the penetration settlement in Africa, is not one that is mandated by the Chinese Communist Party, and it is not one in which those materials come from China. It's one, like America is trying to get going at the moment with huge investments in chip manufacturing and so on, it's one that really has got a Union Jack on it in some ways. And it's also one, and I think this is crucial, the point here from the gentleman at the back on the left about democracy, I think is, for me, the most important thing that's been an undertone to our whole conversation here. Governments, people in elite positions, have consistently failed people in this country and around the world, and trust is at a low ebb. And we need to be in a situation where that kind of change, that kind of movement to an energy system, we have much more of a role in deciding what that is and where it is. And I agree that that is missing, and we need a democratic energy system, not just a new energy system. Okay, brilliant. We thank the panel.